Okay, everyone, I'm going to get started. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining me online tonight. Um, for those of you that don't know me, even though judging by the line of participants, everyone does. Um, my name is Amy Cortez, and I'm the Programming and Communications Director here at Bethesda Jewish Congregation. Um, I'm delighted to be able to share my experience with you um, on the Jewish National Fund Volunteer Mission. Um, I was privileged to join them for um, four full days of volunteer work and then two days of travel. So I was there for a very short time. Um, full disclosure, I have been to Israel before. Um, I have family living there. And while my Hebrew is not great, I know enough to get around. Um, I also did not travel alone. Um, I went with a friend, which was um, amazing. However, there were plenty of um, first time people that had never been to Israel before on this volunteer mission. And there were also um, non-Jewish people on my mission as well, which was um, actually amazing. Um, I'm gonna run a, through a very, very brief history of the modern state of Israel to start. Um, I'm going to ignore the 3000 years before that and I, I hope I'll be forgiven for skipping that whole part. Um, BJC will be running a series of adult education events later in the year and one of those will touch on the 3000 years prior to the modern state of Israel. So I hope you join our um, email list and um, so that you don't miss out on that. Um, I'm going to ask that everyone stay muted um, please save your questions for the end. You can always type them in the chat box so that you don't um, forget them later. Um, also, um, some slides I'm going to click out of full screen um, because um, the videos, for some reason, are wonky on the full screen. And also, um, there's a website that I would like to click through to, and it won't won't do that if we're um, if we're on full screen for this presentation. Okay, let's go. Here we are. So I left on the 17th. I um, came home on the 23rd. As I said, I was barely there, <laughs> barely there. Um, so here we are. This is uh, 1947. Um, the UN comes up with the UN partition plan to create the state of Israel and a Palestinian state. Everything in the pink was going to be the Palestinian state and everything in the blue was going to be the state of Israel. Um, so the area in which um, Israel is located, that's um, either desert or swamp. This was based on um, where communities were. JNF, um, Jewish National Fund, had purchased a lot of land in the Galilee. So that's why that whole like area around the Sea of Galilee is blue. JNF owned a lot of land around there. Um, Jerusalem, you can see, was going to be an international zone. So nobody is going to rule Jerusalem. Jerusalem was going to be um, a multinational city. Um, okay, that plan was rejected um, by the Arab states. And now we have the War of Independence in 1948, which um, the Palestinians call the Nakba, the cat catastrophe, which for them, let's be honest, was a catastrophe. Um, most Palestinians in Israel either um, fled on their own, or they were forced out to leave um, by the Israeli army. Um, and Israel was attacked on all sides. So Lebanon and Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and from inside the country as well. Um, Israel wins. And Judea and Samaria, which is, um, oh, my mouse isn't working, um, which is the green area, um, becomes under uh, control of Jordan. So if you remember from the previous map, that was supposed to be part of a Palestinian state. Yeah, so now it's part of Jordan and it's renamed the West Bank because it is the West Bank of the Jordan River. So you have the East Bank of the Jordan River and you have the West Bank of the Jordan River. And so Jordan controls that whole green area. The Gaza Strip belongs to Egypt. You can see it there in blue, belongs to Egypt. So the Palestinians lose everything. Some of it goes to Israel, some of it goes to Jordan, some of it goes to Egypt, and the Palestinians get nothing. Okay, so this is Israel in 1949. Between 1947 
1972, the neighboring Arab countries force all their Jewish population to leave. It's about 900,000 people. So now there's about 8,000 Jewish people in those countries, but there used to be massive, massive communities in Iran, Iraq, Syria. I believe the New York Times actually did an article on the last Jew in Iraq a few years ago. It was a pretty um, fascinating article. Um, most of them, about 600,000, moved to Israel. There's a very large um, Mizrahi community now in, um, in Israel from those countries. 1967, the Six Day War. Israel is attacked by Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, and subsequently triples in size by the end of the war. They get the Golan Heights, they get the West Bank, and they conquer all of the Sinai Peninsula. They get everything. Look at that giant, Israel's huge now. I mean, <laughs> comparatively, it's like the size of New Jersey, but now it's triple the size of New Jersey. So still, still pretty small, but you know, it triples in size. Israel goes to the Arab countries and says, we're willing to make peace. We will give it all back. We're just asking for recognition, peace treaties, trade. All the Arab countries get together in uh, Khartoum and they come up with um, a seven bullet point statement. The third one is the most important. It's become very famous. It's the three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiation with Israel. So they flat out reject any land for peace deal. It's just a big flat no. Okay. So after 1967, Israel decides it's going to settle the Sinai Peninsula. Okay. So it starts moving families right over the border in the Sinai Peninsula. There's a bunch of little communities popping up in the Sinai Peninsula. Then the Yom Kippur War happens in 1973, about 51 years ago. And um, by some miracle, Israel wins this war. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen the Golda Meir documentary. Um, it's wonderful, but this happened under Golda Meir's watch. Um, I know a lot of people like to say it was a failure of the Israeli intelligence, but it was a failure of the Israeli government. Intelligence knew what was going on, and the government did not act. So failure of the government, not Israeli intelligence. Israel somehow manages to win this war. And what happens is they actually sign a peace treaty. Camp David Accords, 1978. Okay, They sign a peace treaty with Egypt. Egypt gets back the entire Sinai Peninsula. And you can see I mean, it's very, very small, but you can see these militarized zones where the lines are of how many troops Egypt is allowed to have in each zone. So they can either have full troops or they can only have military police. It's a very planned out peace treaty here. But Egypt does not want the Gaza Strip back. They don't want it back. They say, nope, hang on to it. So Israel hangs on to the Gaza Strip. Remember I, I told you that Israel had started settling people in the Sinai Peninsula? So now these families have to move. So all these families get uprooted from the Sinai Peninsula. Some of them move to Israel proper and some of them move to the Gaza Strip. Okay, so some of those settlers are now settling in the Gaza Strip. Okay, we're skipping past the first and second intifadas. And we're moving to 2005, Ariel Sharon is prime minister. And Ariel Sharon was um, previously very pro-settlement. He said once that the communities in Gaza were just as important as Tel Aviv. So for Ariel Sharon to come up with this disengagement plan was a complete turnaround from what he had said previously. So on the map, you see all these little um, green, yellow diamonds that are listed there on the map? There's Delgit, Nisanit, Nazarim, Kfar Darom. Those are all the Jewish communities in Gaza, all of them, okay? There's, there are 8,000 people there, 8,000 people in those 21 communities. And Ariel Sharon does a unilateral disengagement. He pulls the IDF out. He pulls all those people out. It splits the country, okay? 
there are massive protests all over Israel. Um, a lot of the Jewish Gaza Strip communities protested. They had to be forcibly removed um, and their homes were demolished so that they could not move back in. Bibi Netanyahu <laughs> resigned as finance minister in protest over the unilateral withdrawal. Here's what he said about the withdrawal. Only we in the Knesset are able to stop this evil. Everything that the Knesset has decided, it is also capable of changing. I am calling on all those who grasp the danger, gather strength and do the right thing. Don't give the Palestinians guns, don't give them rockets, don't give them a seaport, and don't give them a huge base for terror. Okay, so this is 2005. Israel pulls completely out of the Gaza Strip, okay, completely. No Israelis left in there. Not the army, not a settler, no civilians, nobody. Okay, the next year, 2006, Hamas wins the Palestinian elections. Okay, displacing Fatah. Fatah rejects that. <laughs> so I was like, we don't accept that at all. There is no love lost between the two Palestinian groups. Um, Fatah is a secular group. Um, they believe in a two-state solution. Um, Hamas is a terror group. They are Sunni Muslim. Um, their stated charter is the annihilation of all Israel and a Sunni Muslim state put in its place. There is no negotiation on that side. And you could actually fall into a Wikipedia rabbit hole about the many, many battles that Hamas and Fatah have fought against each other, many horrible killings on both sides. Um, Hamas famously fired into a crowd of 200,000 people in Gaza City in 2009, killing a bunch of people. Um, Hamas is um, coined a very catchy phrase, which has become a very popular protest chant here in the United States. I'm sure you've heard it. It is from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It's very catchy. That is uh, the Hamas um, battle cry. When they say from the river to the sea, they mean from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. And it is a call to annihilate every Jewish person in Israel and put in its place a Sunni Muslim state. So it's a very catchy phrase that the majority of people here in the United States do not understand what exactly they're saying when they say that. Okay, Hamas rules in the Gaza Strip with an iron hand. There is no money entering Gaza that Hamas does not touch first, okay? They rule everything. They run the Ministry of Health, they run the hospitals, they run the schools, they run everything, okay? And it's because of Hamas and Hezbollah in the North, um, the second Lebanon war was also in 2006, um, 4,000 rockets were fired on Israel that year, um, forcing the evacuation of 250,000 people. Um, 8,000 rockets were fired from the Gaza Strip after Hamas took over that year. Um, that's when um, Iron Dome came into play. Iron Dome started um, being developed that year, 2005, 2006, and it became operational in 2011. Iron Dome, honestly, is a technological miracle. It um, intercepts about 80% of the rockets, sometimes a little bit more being fired um, from uh, Gaza or the north. Um, but in terms of thousands of rockets being fired, if you have 4,000 rockets fired at you and it, it, it gets you know, 80% of them, that's still an awful lot of rockets that fall, that don't get intercepted. So I just I just want everyone to recognize <laughs> that there are always rockets being fired in Israel. There is never a day that Israel does not have a rocket fired at it from somewhere, okay? Somewhere there's a rocket being fired at Israel. So this is from Wikipedia. I don't know if you can see this, the Palestinian rocket attacks on Israel. It's every single year. It's a massive, massive list. If you wanna drive yourself really crazy, you can download this great app that all Israelis use. It's called Silfar. I'll post it later. It's on a slide, but it sends you the alerts every time a rocket falls. So if you really want to drive yourself nuts, download that app. Okay. 
here is the current modern state of Israel. We have the West Bank, we have Gaza, we have Israel proper. Okay, population, there's about 7.2 million Jews in Israel. There's 2 million Arabs and half a million are other. They're Bedouin, Druze, Christian, other. In the Gaza Strip, there are 2 million Palestinians. In the West Bank, there are 3,000 Palestinians and 500,000 Israelis. I do want to point out that those 5,000 500,000 Israelis are included in the Jewish population of the modern state of Israel. So those 500,000 belong to the 7.2 million. And this is what actually surprises people when I talk about this. The current worldwide Jewish population is only 15.7 million. There's not a lot of us. We're a very, very small population. There's not a lot of us at all. So about half of us are in Israel. A little bit less than half of us are in the United States. And about 2.2 million are all other countries. Okay, so we're spread out a lot. The Jewish population prior to World War II was actually bigger than it is now. It was 17 million prior to World War II, and now it's 15.7 million. So we're not even up to where we were. But the point of that is, is that the October 7th attacks by Hamas, not only was it um, shocking in its brutality, but Everyone knows someone that was affected by that attack. Um, we like to joke about the, you know, the great Jewish network, but in a way that's sort of true. If you travel anywhere, you could find somebody that knows your cousin, that knows your friend, that you went to school with. It's um because there's not there's not a lot of us. Everybody knows um someone. Okay. I am going to click out of full screen for a second because um this is a map of all the attacks um, on October 7th. Um, at 6.30 in the morning, Hamas um, fired 5,000 rockets into Israel, um, leading to sirens all over Israel. Everyone headed towards their safe rooms. And then while the rockets were going on, they breached the border fence around Gaza, and they attacked by land, they attacked by sea, and they attacked by air. They murdered about 1,200 people, um, they took about 243 hostage, 134 remain in Gaza. Um, it was the worst single day loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust. And not just murdered, but unspeakable atrocities um, Hamas did on the Israeli side. Just, um, they burned children alive. Um, they raped women until their bones broke. I. I Medical people said they had never seen anything like it. And it took months for some people to be identified because they had been burned or mutilated so badly. So this map, I'm going to click on it here, october7thmap.com, is a map of every single death that occurred that day. So if you go to... Nova Festival, which is in Raim. And I, I mean, it's upsetting, it really is. But I really suggest to everybody that you click through and pick a few people and just read about their lives because these were people. These were real people whose lives were, were cut short and may their memories be for a blessing. We shouldn't um, forget them. Um, so you can, you can walk through um, all of these uh, kibbutzim and moshavim that were attacked. And then you also have, um, you can see down here, women's stories. You can you can read um, first person accounts of, um, of the massacre. So this is um, october7thmap.com. Highly, highly recommend. Okay, moving on. Oh, as a warning, okay, I'm not going to dwell on the next slide. It contains graphic imagery. Okay, so I'm just warning everybody now. If you don't want to watch the next slide, I, you know, close your eyes. I will tell you when we, when we click through. Okay. Kibbutz Biari was um, was hit one of the hardest. Um, I think around 91 people died. Um, entire families were burned to death in their homes. Um, 
This is a child's bedroom in Biari. You can see the top right is a burned home in Biari. Um, Biari is one of the, the few communities in the South that I, I don't know if they're gonna come back. I, I don't think there's much of their community to come back to. The bottom um, picture is um, people that were murdered at a bus stop in Throat, which is one of the cities um, in the South. Okay, we are clicking through. Okay, so if you didn't want to see those images, we are safe now. We are on a nice non-graphic imagery page. Okay, so who did I go with to Israel? Who is Jewish National Fund? Jewish National Fund is a nonprofit organization. It was founded in 1901. They've been around for a long, long time. JNF has planted more than 250 million trees in Israel. I'm sure um, everyone knows that like, you know, you have a celebration, you buy a certificate, you plant a tree in Israel. I know I get them from my mom all the time. A tree was planted in your honor. They have built over 250 reservoirs and dams. Um, they've created more than 2,000 parks and they've um, provided the infrastructure for over 1,000 communities. They have done amazing things, um, JNF. They have built bomb shelters all over the South. They have um, helped the kibbutzim. They've built kindergartens. Um, they built a gorgeous amphitheater that seats 16,000 people in Beersheba. Um, JNF does a lot, a lot of work um, in Israel and they run a lot of different programs. And um, I will say that the program I went on was incredibly well run. Hats off to JNF, but they've been around for a very, very long time. Um, my JNF began running volunteer groups to Israel in December of 2023. Um, my week, which was their seventh mission, was their largest mission so far. We had 200 people on six different buses. So I Israel is a 11 hour flight, <laughs> 11 hours from uh, Newark, New Jersey to Tel Aviv. So I left on the 17th. I left um, after Shabbat on the 17th and I got there the 18th, uh, I think around mid afternoon. Um, and this is uh, pictures I took from the bus on our way, driving through Tel Aviv to the Carlton Hotel. Um, you can see the um, the giant Israeli flags. You can see the um, the hostage sign that says, bring them home now. Um, these signs are all over Israel. They are in every town. They are in every city. There is hostage signs everywhere. You There's not a place you can go that, that you don't see it. We did not get a chance to relax <laughs> after our 11 hour flight. Um, we went straight to dinner, dropped off our stuff in the hotel room, went straight to dinner. And then we had a security briefing at 9 p.m. So 9 p.m., everyone's exhausted, but we have our security briefing. And I know it's tough to read that slideshow, but it basically shows you what to do in case of rocket fire. <laughs> it's what, because we were traveling to the South. If you are indoors, you go to the safe room. If you are outdoors, find the nearest building and go in it. If you are in a vehicle, stop on the side of the road, get out of your vehicle and go into the nearest building. And if you can't find the nearest building, then you lie on the ground and you put your hands over your head as protection. If you are in a place like we were, where it's just a field and there's no buildings and there's no bomb shelter, then you just lie on the ground and you put your hands on your head and you pray. The reason you get out of your car or you get out of the bus is that if the rocket hits the bus, it's going to be a fireball and you don't want to be in there. You have a better chance of living if you're out. Okay. After we had our security briefing, an IDF soldier spoke with us. This is Yedidia Harush. And remember in my history of Israel presentation, I told you that some families had settled in the Sinai Peninsula after 1967. Yedidia's parents were one of those settler families that settled in the Sinai Peninsula, had to leave, and they ended up in the Gaza Strip. They settled in the Gaza Strip. Yedidia was actually born in the Gaza Strip and he was 17 when disengagement happened in 2005. He and his family moved right across the border. They now live in a community called Shlomit, 
which is kind of sandwiched. It's like Gaza, Egypt, and Shlomit is kind of tucked into the corner. It's um, a young community. Um, there's 80 families, 300 children, <laughs> a lot of kids, um, a fairly religious community. Um, but the majority are young families. Um, so all of them have served in some capacity in the IDF. This will become important later. We met the community of Shlomit and um, we heard their story. So um, Shlomit came under rocket fire on October 7th. October 8th, they were evacuated by the IDF and um, Yadidia was called up that same day to fight in Gaza. So he did a four month stint fighting in Gaza, which he told um, he told us a little bit about. I um, mean, he's out now um, talking to groups like us about um, what happened in the South and about his experience. Oh, there's that rocket alert app. If you want to look that up, get rocket alerts on your phone. It's great so far. Okay, day one on the Gaza border. Okay, so here's Gaza. I took pictures on my phone screenshot my maps so you could see where where um where I was the first place I was was on um, a place called Kfar Maimon Tushia um you can see this is about three miles from the Gaza border um we did we were there for four and a half hours picking lemons um in the afternoon we went to Beersheba which is a town that's um still within rocket range in the south but um a little bit further away um, we went to the Alexandra Moss High School campus and we made care packages for IDF soldiers. And then the last place we went to, we, we came back to the border and we went to Raim, which is the site of the Nova Festival massacre. Um, you can see Bieri, um, which this kibbutz that I went to was pretty close to Bieri. Bieri was basically, I said, I showed you before, um, they lost a lot of people and the community was basically burned. And then Raim um, is right next to it. So um, that's where I was, three miles from the Gaza border. Okay, so here we are, lemon picking. Here's my whole group. Um, this is just, uh, this is three buses. The six buses split up um, into two different hotels. Three buses were at the Carlton in Tel Aviv. Three buses were at the Kedma. I never saw the people from Kedma. Never. I saw them at the airport. I saw them at the farewell dinner. I didn't see them at all in between. Um, most of the time, I only saw the people that were on my bus. Um, but here we are at lemon picking. We're all together. Um, the three buses from the Carlton. Um, so Kfarm Eimon, um, normally the farm has 50 workers, um, all Thai, Thai from Thailand. Um, they currently only have four. Um, if you click through on that October 7th map, that I showed you where you will see an awful lot of um, Thai workers were killed on October 7th. And um, they were told um, to go home, not by Israel, but by the King of Thailand, <laughs> told them to go home. The vast majority of them did. The vast majority of foreign workers all over Israel went home. Um, so this farm normally has 50 workers. They currently have four. And the community of course was evacuated. So um, by the time I was there, the community had not returned home yet. They, they might be home now. Um, so we do our best. <laughs> They're very grateful for the volunteer work um, from JNF where, you know, we picked um, that morning um, seven tons of lemons, but apparently um, 25 of us are worth one Thai worker. <laughs> so you know, we do, we do what we can, but, um, but yeah, I did not know that lemon trees have thorns. So we had, uh, we had work gloves and we're told, um, to wear long sleeves. And despite that, I still, um, I still got scratches up and down my arms. It was also, I don't know if you could tell in these pictures, but it was raining. So it was really, really muddy. Um, wrecked my shoes, wrecked my jeans. They were not kidding um, JNF when they said it was hard labor. They're very upfront about that. And they also told us to purposely bring clothing that you didn't mind getting ruined. And you'll see um, on day two, how much of my clothing I ruined on, on day two. Okay, so we left uh, Kfar Maimon to Shia and we're driving. And I, this is a little, um, little, 
digression here, but okay, so you can see over on, on the, if you're looking at the map, you can see in the middle on the left, that's Tushia where I was, and the blue dot is um, where I was when I took this picture. That thing in the middle of the fitness center, that box that's painted, that is a bomb shelter. There is a bomb shelter. Um, well, every, by building code, every building has to have a safe room. But every playground has a bomb shelter. Every outdoor fitness area has a bomb shelter. Every bus stop in the South has a bomb shelter. There's bomb, bomb shelters everywhere. And Jewish National Fund um, has this great program that I think is wonderful to make these bomb shelters a little less scary, I, I, you know, for kids, because it is, it's scary. You know, the rockets are falling and you've got to go in this um, giant concrete thing. Um, it's a bomb shelter beautification program. So you personally or your synagogue or your community can sponsor to have these bomb shelters painted by a local artist. And you can pick the theme and then they hire a local artist um, to come and paint it. And you get a little, like there's a little plaque that's attached to the bomb shelter that says this artwork was donated by, you know, Fez to Jewish Congregation in, in Fez to Maryland. And it's just, it's really... It's really, I mean, I'm talking about bomb shelters, but it's really nice because you can you can drive around and there's a lot of amazing art and um, and it's really just a, a nice program. Anyway, so JNF not only um, builds the bomb shelters, but then you can sponsor to have them painted so that they're not as scary. And I, I want you to see here that what JNF is doing right now is they're retrofitting a lot of these bomb shelters with doors because a lot of them didn't have doors because they're meant for missile fire and not for an invasion. So on October 7th, there are a lot of instances where Hamas simply threw a hand grenade into a bomb shelter. So they're retrofitting a lot of these um, with doors. Okay, Be'er Sheva, you can see um, lower right-hand side of this slide, you can see um, where Gaza is and you can see where Be'er Sheva is. So still within rocket range, but it's a it's a big city. And this is where my own prejudices come into play. So this was my first time in Be'er Sheva. I had never been there before. Um, Be'er Sheva is seven wells. It's where um, Abraham originally dug his wells. You can go into the museum there. Um, I always thought of Be'er Sheva as sort of a nothing, little town. I don't know why I thought that. There's 650,000 people <laughs> live in Beersheba. It's um, it's beautiful. The city's beautiful. They have a, a gorgeous man-made lake there, the amphitheater, the um, the river park. It's just, it's just beautiful. So Alexandra Muss High School um, has just built a new South Campus in Beersheba. This used to be um, part of an army base. <laughs> it had a lot of work to do. Um, but the campus is just, it's just gorgeous. Um, and they're expected to have, um, they're expected to open it this summer. Okay, so here we are, we're, um, we're making um, care packages for IDF soldiers. Um, and we, we wrote little notes for them. Um, you could do Hebrew or you could do English. Um, there is a QR code um that's up there um if you could per you could actually purchase these packages for soldiers and evacuees you could also support the western galilee so all of these products that were in the boxes came from um the galilee which is all the way up north um the galilee currently is under rocket fire so israel is is really fighting on two fronts um they're in gaza and they are um the whole north is under rocket fire right now from hezbollah in lebanon so it's it's not not great. So um, a lot of communities up there have been evacuated. So all of these products are from um, companies located in the Galilee. Um, again, we had an IDF soldier speak to us about what these care packages mean to the soldiers. Um, Israel had called up 350,000 people um, up to the age of 50. Um, my own family was called. They are out. I'm very happy about that, that they're not... Uh, they're not fighting anymore, but um, yeah. So here they are. Um, you can see that he's carrying his gun with him. Oh, I should mention that we had an armed guard with us at all times. That's just something um, most tour groups have in Israel. You have someone called a medic and they will be armed and walking around with you. So we had an armed guard at all times. 
Okay, so after we made care packages for the soldiers, we went back to the Gaza border, to Raim, the site of the Nova Music Festival Massacre. This was a, um, a, a few day music festival. There were 3000 people there. And um, Hamas did not know that this music festival was going on. You could say they just got lucky that there were that many people there. Um, they killed about 360 people out of the 3000 that were there. They injured scores of others and they kidnapped quite a few. So now Raim is this um, makeshift memorial to everybody that's died. So the, the top picture um, next to the map um, you, where you see the Israeli flags and there's like sticks in the ground, um, that is people planting trees. That's what we do. We plant trees um, in memoriam of somebody. So people are planting trees there. I also want to point out that this is very, um, pretty flat land near Reim, and there's not a lot of trees there. These people had nowhere to go. They had nowhere to hide. It's just flat land. Um, we also saw um, the burnt out cars from the festival. Um, so you can walk through and you can see um, all the photos of everybody. Um, they also have um, billboards up for the people that are kidnapped and still in Gaza. And I'm going to, oh, you know what? Let me do this. Here we go. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exit this because otherwise this video gets wonky. I don't, I don't know why, but you'll be able to hear the artillery booming in the background. Um, we heard that all day um, when we were lemon picking, we could hear the IDF um, artillery in Gaza and we, you could hear it here. It's about the 22nd mark. Um, so keep, your, keep your, um, your ears open. And if anybody heard that, so that that was the IDF artillery um, in the background. That was um, a little surreal. Took a little um, getting used to. Um, I will say that in the south, I um, I didn't I didn't feel unsafe in the south. The IDF is all over the south. Um, it was really fine. This is um, a troop of IDF soldiers. Um, they sang um, um, a, basically a prayer for the dead. If you've ever been to a shiva, you'll recognize this. They're basically saying Shiva for um, everybody um, that had died at Re'im. That was a very um, tough place to walk through. Um, oops. Do that. Okay, and that was my that was my day one. We got back to the hotel I think around ten o'clock at night. Um, wake up was five thirty in the morning. Breakfast was at six. She had to be back on the bus at seven. So, not much time to enjoy um, the Carlton Hotel, which if you're ever in Israel and you have the chance to visit Tel Aviv, is one of the best hotels there. It's right on the beach. It's lovely. Okay, day two, we were back on the Gaza border. Uh, we were at Kibbutz Or Haner, which you see on the map is um, right next to a kibbutz named uh, Erez. Um, that is where the border crossing is, the Erez border crossing. Um, around 18,000 Palestinians used to cross every day from the Gaza Strip into Israel. And as we now know, an awful lot of them were spying. Um, Hamas had detailed maps of all of these little communities, including where the schools were, where the armories were, um, they knew an awful lot of information. So Kibbutz Or Haner um, is right there across the street from Erez. They came under rocket fire. Um, 
Thankfully, they did not get attacked by terrorists, but they did send people to help Erez, which was right across the street. Um, after we were at Orhaner, we met with um, the trauma team at Soroka Hospital in Beersheba, um, which was a very graphic slideshow um, led by the, the main surgeon there. Um, and then at night, we went to a place called Gilat Junction, which um, I think is my second map here. Ooh, I did not mean to do that at all. Um, Okay, so here's Gilat Junction. It's right near Ofakim. And you can see that it's about mm, 10 miles from the Gaza border. So Gilat Junction is an absolutely amazing place. Um, these five friends and brothers um, decided to um, do a pop-up barbecue place right at the Gaza border at Gilat Junction. And it now has um, showers and it has laundry and it's for the IDF soldiers so that they can come um, either in their way to Gaza or on their way out of Gaza and they get um, they get free food and they can use the showers and use the laundry and there's a, there's a DJ there playing music and it's for a few hours they get to feel um, a little bit human. And so it's completely run by volunteers. Um, and it's really, they serve thousands of soldiers a day and it's really, um, it's an amazing place. So that's where we were um, at night. Okay, clicking forward. Okay, so this is Kibbutz Or Haner. And I just, I just want you to, to see this. This is typical for a kibbutz, okay? I mean, thank God. Every kibbutz has a fence and a gate. You cannot just walk into a kibbutz or a moshavim, you have to be let in. Um, so you can see that there's a there's a fence going around it. This is the gate going out. And um, Orhan there was evacuated. Um, they were supposed to return on March 1st. I hope they did. Um, so what uh, my group was doing was um, refurnishing and, and revamping their children's spaces. So their, their school, their kindergarten, um, their lounge. We painted outside and inside. We built picnic tables. Um, some people um, chose to garden. We painted furniture. We ripped out floors. It's a lot of work. We were there for um, four and a half hours. Um, this is a bomb shelter outside one of the schools. You could see that the kids painted tiles to make it pretty. But this is um, a typical bomb shelter. You can see the, the bomb shelters. This is um, the middle picture is Lilach. Um, she's um, one of the families that lives at Orhaner. She was speaking to us about how much she appreciated us being there um, because it makes it made the community feel like that they weren't alone. It was a very sweet speech from her. Um, and those two, you can see those two kind of boxy little things. Those are bomb shelters. Um, that are there next to them. So then um, we had a special treat. We had Russell Robinson, who's the CEO of JNF, um, come and talk to us. Um, he he gave a, a decently long speech. I, I just clipped um, 45 seconds. You are going to help build and rebuild. Look at we guy. could have gotten people to do it. <laughs> but our Jewish world since October 7th had a wake up call about coming together. And it is our obligation to build together, to not only a building, but to get to know the people, the kibbutzim, the, the soldiers, the people in the hotel. This is one Jewish world and we're stronger, united, being part together. So Russell Robinson, I was very, you know, excited that um, he took the time to come speak to us. Um, he's currently the CEO of JNF. So. Um, this is a, I think, I think the left hand, the right hand side um, top is the before and the, the bottom um, right hand side is the after. I think we did a great job on the outside. I don't know if you could see the picture of my hair. I had yellow paint all over my hair. Um, I painted that, um, that bike rack you see on the ground and I didn't notice that my hair, um, that my hair was, was getting in it. Um, if you see in, in the, um, the top left picture you see that there's sort of like a like a box with like a mural on it like a boxy little that's a that's the bomb shelter directly outside the kindergarten um and it had a mural on it that um another group will um will paint a different mural on it um we painted over that 
that whole thing. We also painted um, tires. I don't know exactly what they were going to do with them, but we spray painted tires in rainbow colors. And um, I would I would be excited to go back to Orhan there and see um, see what the the finished stuff looked like because while we did a lot of work, I'm gonna <laughs> we didn't we didn't finish it for sure. Um, yeah, the paint came out of my hair. By the way, <laughs> it did come out of my hair. So then we went to um, back to their Shavo where we were the day before. We went to Soroka Hospital. This is a massive, massive hospital complex. It's not just this building that you see. There's more buildings to the um, the left of it. And then right behind it, you can see on the map, is Ben Gurion University. So Soroka Hospital is a teaching hospital because the um, the medical school is, is right behind it. Um, Soroka Hospital handled most of the wounded on October 7th. They handled something like over 640 people. They had one wounded person every 39 seconds um, come into their emergency room. And Beersheva was also under rocket fire at that time. Um, and remember that October 7th was a holiday, so a lot of staff was off. So not only did staff have to come in on their holiday, but um, they had to drive while the sirens were going off to get to Soroka Hospital. And then the enormity of what was happening, um, massively understaffed, they pulled in everybody. They pulled in ophthalmologists, they pulled in everybody they had to help with the um, just the, the massive amount of people that they had coming in. And um, not only did they have to deal with the trauma of what was happening coming in through their doors, but they had some staff members that were kidnapped they had some staff members that were killed, so they were they were dealing with that um, on top of all of this. So we spoke to um, Dr. Svi Perry. He's the senior surgeon of the trauma unit at Soroka Hospital. Um, so you can see in um, I did not take screenshots of the graphic slides in this slideshow. Um, just did not. But you can see they had um, 671 people wounded people walking through their doors in the first. 24 hours. Um, a lot of them were um, children or older people. Um, he went over like the basic principles of um, what they do in trauma, but they are right now revamping um, their uh, hospital training because um, obviously their trauma team was not enough to handle what was happening. So now every doctor is going to be trained in trauma. So that if they ever, God forbid, have another mass casualty event like this, um, they will be better prepared. Also, they were still under rocket fire. So a lot of times they had to move people. They had to move people out of an unprotected ward into a protected ward. And Dr. Perry <laughs> told us in his, um, in his presentation that he did things that would probably get him fired in the United States, but they were so overwhelmed with people and a lot of them were very, very badly wounded that um, he sent people into surgery without x-rays, without scans, just to save their life, um, which yeah, in the United States that would, you know, there'd be lawsuits coming out of their ears, but, um, but you know, they did, um, they did what they had to do and they, they saved an, an awful lot of people. So I'm going to play this. Um, I'm going to exit this because the video gets wonky, but I'm going to play this video for you. Um, and I really want you to pay attention to the end because Soroka Hospital um, treats everybody. They treat civilians and the military, and they also treat Hamas. So you can listen to um, Dr. Perry's. Um, like Dr. Polanyi and Dr. Baby. Might need to turn your volume up. They have kids who are in the army, who are soldiers in very, very elite units. And each and every day that a helicopter comes and they hear the name of that specific elite unit, their heart misses a beat. Mm -hmm. And, and in, the, in the, each and every time they see the people who come, and they see that they are not their kids, I'm sorry to say it's horrible, but it's true. They feel relieved. But that's the difference. Israel is a big difference. But when we are talking about the trauma surgeon, people come, they have ailments, we take care of them. It doesn't really matter what they are. And as I said to the person here, they could be a Hamas terrorist, okay? I took care just a week ago 
of the paramedical Sinwa, <laughs> of the paramedical Sinwa. He was caught in Khan Yunus, okay? He was treated there, treatment was not enough, he was brought to our hospital. I put a chest tube for him. He survived due to that. Later on, he de deteriorated in the detention facility, and I got him again, okay? He was a patient, like any other patient. And I took care of him, and my team did a fabulous work as they do each, each and every one. It's easy when you're treating people, it's really easy. Last but not least. So um, he is a better man um, than I think I could be. Um, I don't, if you did not hear that, he treated um, one of Sinwar's staff members. Um, Sinwar, of course, is a, is a high-ranking Hamas um, official. He was one of the masterminds behind October 7th. Um, and um, yeah, this guy, um, he said, uh, Dr. Perry told us later that, um, you know, uh, Sinwar staff member did give up some valuable information later. So it was a good thing that they saved his life. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know that I could be a, a decent enough person to do that. So Soroka Hospital treats everybody. They treat, <laughs> they literally treat um, everybody. Um, if you would like more details on what Soroka handled on October 7th, Time Magazine um, did a really great article about it. Um, you can look it up, Israel Soroka Hospital, October 7th. Um, they interviewed a bunch of doctors there. Um, some of it's a little graphic, so um, I'm just sending out that, that warning now. Um, they do have, um, they did bring in a psychiatric team to um, talk to all the uh, trauma team that were there on October 7th, um, just to process um, what happened um, what happened on that day. That was one of the questions that, that somebody had. My own behalf, I'm talking about. And then we went to Gilat Junction, which was a lot of fun. So this is the, um, this is the A-team, this is their QR code, if you wanna look them up, um, if you need, um, help translating the Hebrew, just come, come talk to me. Um, but the A-team, and I don't know if, does anyone remember that show? <laughs> the A-team with Murdoch, that the A-team just, just makes me smile. Um, so they're, as I said, they're completely run um, by volunteers and donors, and they have um, this coffee shop that's, um, you can see it on the, the lower right, and um, this covered portico is where all the food is. There's barbecue, there's hamburgers, there's um, even some Ashkenazi stuff <laughs> there. Um, so it's, it was really... Um... So it's really, it's really a nice place for the soldiers to come um, and hang out on their way in or their way out. Um, it's just really nice. And while we were there, while we were at Gilat Junction, um, we met a group called um, Specials in Uniform. And this group was formed um, back in 2001 by uh, Major General Gabby Ophir. He was the head, um, I see a spelling mistake in my slide, the head of um, the IDF's Home Front Command. His daughter is autistic. And the reason he formed um, this squad was because um, in Israel, it's one of the first questions people ask you when they meet you. If you're Israeli, they say, Wait, where do you serve? Where did, where did you serve? Because um, everyone between 18 and 21 you know, serves in the army. So um, for people that have disabilities or people with autism, um, you know, they were not accepted into the IDF. And so it's, you know, it's a sort of blow to your self-esteem when somebody asks you, where do you serve? And you have to say, I didn't, um, you know, so they formed this, um, this group called Special in Uniform and they're, they're part of the IDF. And what they actually found is that some of these, um, young adults can do things that other IDF soldiers can't do. So they have two, um, they have two people right now in the specials in uniform that all they do is sit in front of a, in computers all day and they, they look at photographs. They have photographic memories and they can tell when like a rock has been moved. 
they can tell the slightest difference in photographs, like from timestamp photographs. And so they've been able to find bombs just by looking at photographs. And that's not something that a, that a normal um, IDF soldier can do. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's strength everywhere. And I think that's an absolutely amazing thing. So in 2014, the IDF partnered with JNF to bring the program national. And while we were there, not at Gila Junction, but while we were in Israel, they just swore in their 1,000th soldier, which is really, really nice. Um, if you want more information about um, Special in Uniform, it's specialinuniform.com. Um, really a great group. So um, I have two videos for you from this group. Just killing me here. Um, so they have a band. Specials in uniform as a band, and they're amazing. So they did um they did a performance um for us, which was I thought they were great. So I'm sorry. I thought they were amazing. They did a full 15 minute set. Um, they were they were just great. These 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 soldiers were just um, absolutely amazing. Um, I highly recommend that you look them up. It's called um, Special in Uniform. They were um, they were really wonderful. Um, so that was Gilat uh, Junction. And if you would like to donate to um, the A team, they would be delighted because again they are. Um, completely volunteer run. They thrive on donations. They have volunteers from all over Israel coming down to cook. I'm actually wearing my A-Team shirt. Um, you can see my little A-Team shirt. It says, um, love always wins on the back. You can't see it's in Hebrew, but it says love always wins on the back. It's just, um, they're really just a, a great group and they're doing um, amazing things down there um, at the God. At the God. I love you, USA. Yeah, they were very, very nice. Okay, D3. <laughs> Again, up early. So this is the first day I did not go to the Gaza border. Um, I went slightly north. Um, you can see on the map on the right, there's Herzliya, there's Natanya. So I was, you can see the blue dot. Um, I was there. I was at a um, community called Ramat Shmuel. Um, strawberry picking. But this isn't like strawberry picking here where you're frolicking through a field with your kids. It's it's not not like that at all. So after um, strawberry picking, um, we went to the Kramen Hotel to speak with the community of Shlomit. That was the community um, by the Gaza border. I remember I that IDF soldier Yadidia had come from Shlomit. Um, I will tell you Shlomit's um, story. Um, and then um, we went back to Tel Aviv um, for the building called the Forum for Missing Persons and Hostages. Um, they have a building and we spoke to um, hostage families there. Okay, so slightly north, not south on day three. Um, here we are, here's my, my very fashionable strawberry picking footwear. You can see my legs are covered in um, plastic bags. Um, that is because, I don't know if you could see these nylon aisles that are between all the strawberry rows. Okay, there's no place to sit down. You can barely walk through that. There's no place to sit down. And that middle aisle, it's full of water and mud and rotten strawberries because um, the farmers told us that the most important thing for us to do was to get rid of all the rotten strawberries because one rotten strawberry can infect the entire plant. 
So it was most important to get rid of the rotten ones. And so where did the rotten, where did the rotten ones go? They go in the middle section where you're walking. So that's where it was. Now you could see, do you see that shed that's all the way in the back? That's where the bathroom was located. So you walk all the way across the field to get to it. It was a single stall in a small gal galvanized shed. The door did not close all the way. So you needed a buddy to sort of stand outside and make sure nobody was accidentally opening that door on you. Okay, so strawberry picking, yes. This was um, backbreaking work, actually. So this farm, this is a very big farm. It usually has 80 workers. It has 50 Palestinian and 30 Thai. Obviously, no Palestinian workers are there now. Israel revoked all work permits, so there are no Palestinians allowed to work in Israel at the moment. Um, and 23 of their Thai workers left. So they were down to seven Thai workers for this giant, giant farm. And JNF was not the only group um, working this farm. There was um, an Orthodox youth group um, from Israel. There was a synagogue from Tampa, Florida that was at this uh, strawberry field. And there was also um, a troop of female IDF soldiers for picking strawberries here because, you know, Produce has to get out. All the produce that we picked gets sold in Israel. It goes to feed Israel, so it's not getting um, it's not getting exported. It's staying um, in Israel. Strawberry picking. Um, okay, so this guy, very nice guy. His name is Uri. Um, he was also at lemon picking. He is um, one of the directors of Hashomer Chachadash, um, which is a group that JNF runs. It's a it's sort of um, a, it's another volunteer group. And it's called Hashomer Chahadash is the new guard. And they guard all the farms. They protect it from um, theft, arson, vandalism, and it's volunteer run. Um, so Ori is um, part of that group. I was, very, I, could see, I was very happy to see him for the second day. Very nice guy. Um, but you can see more of, um, if you go on the JNF website, you can see more about um, Hashomer Chahadash. Um, but they um, they currently are running the farm groups to um, to help with um, to help with the farm. So this guy that's next to Ori, I cannot remember his name for the life of me, but he's one of the farmers. So he was explaining to us, um, you know, how many workers they normally have in the process between um, you know the seasons of strawberries and how how really difficult it's been um, since the war um, started. Okay, Kramim Hotel. This is outside Jerusalem. So you can see Jerusalem on the map. You can see the blue dot. That's where the Kramim Hotel is. The Kramim Hotel is one of the best hotels in Israel. It is a resort and spa. It has beautiful views. It's up in the mountains. It is absolutely gorgeous. On a normal basis, there are no kids allowed at the Kramim Hotel. It is adults only. But since, um, since October, they have been hosting the entire community of Shlomit. That is 80 families. That is hundreds of kids. There's a lot of kids running around the Kramim Hotel right now. Um, when they were evacuated October 8th, um, they were given 20 minutes to pack. And then the IDF escorted them out of Shlomit. They just returned home last week. I have um, video of this. So if you can see um, the second map that's on the right, because um, this is going to be um, important information. Do you see Shlomit is on the bottom left of that map? The map on the right. And the bottom left of that map, you can kind of see Shlomit. And then sort of up towards the east, you see Prigan. P-R-I-G-A-N. Okay. So as I said before, Shlomit is a young community. Prigan is an older community. They um, don't really have a defense team. Mm -hmm. um, they were um, attacked on October 7th, Prigan. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And because they don't have, can, can everybody make sure that you're muted for me, please? Um, because they don't, they didn't have a defense team. They sent a WhatsApp distress text to um, Shlomit, the community of Shlomit. Now, I, I, I'm. 
Is everyone familiar with, with WhatsApp? It's, it's the main form of communication in Israel. I mean, I, I use WhatsApp. Um, everybody uses WhatsApp. JNF uses WhatsApp. Um, so Prigan and Shlomit are about a four minute drive away from each other. And they have sort of a relationship. They read the Megillah together every year. So when Prigan was in trouble, they texted um, Shlomit. Now Shlomit, um, like all the communities in the South came under rocket fire starting at 6.30 in the morning. So everybody's in their safe rooms. And here's the thing about the safe rooms that are everywhere. While the doors shut, they don't lock, okay? They don't lock. Again, these safe rooms and these bomb shelters were built for missiles. They were not built for invasions. So they don't lock. So if you're not holding that handle, anybody can open that door from the outside. So once they started getting WhatsApp messages and they realized what was going on, not just rocket fire, but they realized what was going on, um, they had a major dilemma here. So this woman that is speaking, um, her name is Tamar. Um, she is She's sitting down because she's usually pregnant um, with her sixth child. But she was telling us that the rocket started at 6.30 in the morning. They gathered all their kids up and they went into the safe room and they knew that something different was going on because of just the massive amount of rockets that were coming down. And then when they started getting WhatsApp messages, they realized that it was worse than just rocket fire. It was an actual um, invasion. So Shlomit got this WhatsApp message and then had a decision to make. Do they send people to defend Prigan, leaving Shlomit undefended? Because even though they haven't been attacked yet, they might be, they're right over the border. Or do they keep their people home and let Prigan defend themselves? In the end, um, they asked for volunteers. Shlomit asked for volunteers from their group. They sent 11 volunteers to fight. Um, they ended up fighting 15 Hamas terrorists at Prigan, and four were killed. Um, four Shlomit members were killed, um, leaving 15 children with no father. But they did chase off the um, Hamas terrorists. They killed two. The rest of them ran, and nobody from Prigan died. So nobody from the community of Prigan died, um, thanks to the, the volunteers from Shlomit that went to fight. These uh, kibbutzim and moshavim on the border, um, they are also revamping um, their security. Um, usually the kibbutz has a centralized armory where they store everything, but now they're gonna have um, everyone individually armed because since Hamas knew where the armories were, they shot people as they were heading towards the armories. So people are gonna be individually armed. Now, normally Israel gets only 50,000 applications a year for a personal weapon. Since October 7th, they've gotten 350,000 applications for a personal weapon. It's a massive, massive jump. Um, and Tamar was telling us about the evacuation. She said the IDF didn't come until the morning. So all night long, they were in their safe room holding the handle of the door. Um, the IDF came in the morning and said, we're evacuating you. You have 20 minutes to pack. And then all the cars need to be at the gate. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you pack in 20 minutes? And, and the, the weather, um, they didn't know how long they were going to be gone. And, you know, the weather in Israel, I mean, when I went, it was in the sixties, but come July and August, it's going to be a hundred degrees. So, you know, what do you um, pack? And she, you know, Tamar has five children. She's um, expecting her six. It's it's a lot to deal with. And the amazing thing to me was that all of these um, people we spoke to from Shlomit, they wanted to go home. They were not afraid to go back. They wanted to go home, which was amazing. So here is a video um, of the community of Shlomit going home last week. They got a... I 
I think that's a lovely um, welcome for the for the community of um, of Shlomit. Okay, then we went um, from Jerusalem. We went back to um, Tel Aviv. This is the um, the hostage and missing families forum. This is their building. Um, you can see the big sign that says "Bring them home now." Um, this tech company, Checkpoint, donated their building to this organization. Um, this was founded by one of the fathers of um, a hostage. He felt that he he felt the Israeli government was not doing enough to bring people home. Um, so um, Hostage Square, which I will show you later, is located um, pretty much right across the street from the defense ministry. <laughs> it's, it's right across the street. That's on purpose so that they have to see it all the time. Um, so we, this is, um, this man that's seated, um, in the wheelchair in the bottom, his name is Daron. Uh, he lives in one of the kibbutzim in the South and he, um, his family adopts lone soldiers. So a lone soldier is like an American or a, a, a someone from England or France that chooses to go and fight for the IDF and they come over to Israel and they're in like an Ulpan program and they go on the IDF and um, they be eventually become Israeli citizens. So um, he adopted um, Idan Alexander, 19 from Tenafly, New Jersey. Um, that's Idan's picture um, up at the top. And um, Idan was kidnapped on October 7th and is still in Gaza right now. So Daron, I don't know if you could see, but Daron is wearing Idan's um, shirt, uh, face on his shirt. Um, Daron is, is doing everything he can to um, to bring Idan home. Um, and you can see that there's, there's pictures everywhere. There's um, a video here. I only took um, partial video of it, but um, it shows shows the missing people in family pictures. So I, I only took um, a short video of that. You could you could stand there for for quite a while um, looking at those photos. Um, one of the most um, emotionally impactful things I think we did on the JNF um, J, this JNF volunteer trip was was not just you know feeling good about what we were doing. I mean we're actually doing real work helping people, but speaking with um, the communities that were affected and speaking with um, families of the the current hostages was. Um, very emotionally impactful, at least for me. Day four. Day four was, I'm I'm gonna say not really a volunteer day. Not so much, not not so much volunteer day, um, which I was grateful for because I was in a lot of pain from strawberry picking the day before. Um, everything, everything hurt by day four. Okay, so we were in Tel Aviv and uh Jerusalem on day four. Um, I knew that I was going to have time at the um, hotel before I left. Um, if you were one of the people that um, that gave me a note to shove in the the hotel wall, just um, you know, I got it there. <laughs> it's it's in the wall. It's great to go. It's all good. Um, we went to Hostage Square in Tel Aviv to speak with um, families of hostages. We um, planted memorial trees in Ben Shemin Forest. We went to Ammunition Hill in Jerusalem. I had not been there since 1998. So that was a, a treat for me to go to Ammunition Hill. We went to the Kotel. I got a nice little surprise because um, we had, I think about an hour at Machane Yehuda. Um, my, uh, two of my coworkers were um, delighted by that. I got them rugelach from Marzipan Bakery <laughs> that I brought home with me. And then we had um, our farewell um, dinner. So you can see here um, the blue dot on the first map. Um, this is Hostage Square, and you can see it's right in front of the um, Tel Aviv um, 
Museum of Art. And then um, the defense ministry is pretty much um, right across the street. The second map um, is where Ben Shemin Forest is. It's um, sort of in the middle between um, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Okay, so this is Hostage Square, that giant building right there. There's the defense ministry. <laughs> so it's right, it's right across the street. They have this giant clock there that ticks up detailing the amount of days that the hostages have been held. Um, there's a lot of art installations at Hostage Square that you can walk through, but I think the most important thing here, besides the actual families themselves that are in Hostage Square, are the um, this giant wall that shows everyone that was kidnapped. It is a very big wall. You can see Kfir Bibas. He's um, you know, very famous right now because he he's a baby and he's um he's in Gaza. It's, um, it's a very big wall. Um, then we went to uh, Ben Shemin Forest. This is um as I said, halfway between uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, we were all given um, a card with the name of someone who died in the October 7th attack. Um, my card was Oren Alfasi. He was uh, 22 years old. He died holding the door against terrorists, um, protecting his girlfriend. Um, his girlfriend lived. Um, Oren did not. He was 22. Um, you can read about his life um, on the October 7th map. This is where I um, I took this text from. This is straight from his mother. Um, again, I, I really highly recommend that you go through um, all of that. So we all planted trees for people. That's what we do. We plant trees. Um, we said Kaddish for everybody. It's just um, really an unspeakable tragedy. So Ammunition Hill um, is where uh, the main battle was fought in 1967 for Jerusalem. It's really a, a cool place. The battlefield is pretty much how it was left. You can see all the trenches. Um, the tanks are still there. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, this man, Alone Wald, um, is head of operations at Ammunition Hill. I would have loved to bring him to BJC this past weekend. He was in DC. Um, I would have loved to bring him to speak. Um, I'm hoping that he'll he'll come back to the United States. Um, he was fascinating to um, to listen to. Um, I highly recommend going to Ammunition Hill once you're in Jerusalem. Um, they have a, a new museum there that they didn't have the last time I was there, um, 25 years ago, um, that you can walk through. And this wall with all the little um, plaques on it, those green plaques, if, um, if you're Jewish and you have a member, um, a family member or friend that served in in any army, really American, um, Israeli, whatever, um, you can honor them with a plaque um, on this wall. Um, you just contact JNF to see how you can get um, your loved one's name up there, um, living or dead. You can um, do it while they're alive, which is a great way um, of showing them you here. So then we went to the Western Wall. We went to the Kotel. Um, and something amazing happened while we were at the Kotel. There was a proposal. Somebody got proposed to while we were at uh, we were at the wall. And um, a bunch of IDF soldiers and yeshiva students um, danced around the couple. So I have um, I have video. I don't know why the sound's not on. Ooh. You guys can't hear that, can you? Yeah, I'm not sure why. Um, but you can see all the yeshiva students um, dancing. It's just really, it was really a nice moment. It was a sweet moment to witness. It was really great. I will try to um, 
post this separately later. You can see the couple in the middle with her big bouquet of flowers. It's really nice. <laughs> it's really sweet. And of course they got, um, you know, mazel tubs from, from everybody. I don't know why it's not, um, I don't know why the sound isn't going. Okay. Oh, I hope this one works. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. No, it's not working either. This is Mahane Yehuda. This is um, the Shook in Jerusalem. Um, I called it in this video, Reading Terminal on Steroids. If you've ever been to Reading Terminal in Philadelphia, it's just, it's a massive little um, community of, of all different types of food booths and pubs and little shops where you can buy stuff you don't need. I spent way too much money <laughs> in Mahane Yehuda. Um, that's my friend Dawn on the on the left, who is um you know who came with me. Um, the guy I'm in the, the selfie with that is um the armed guard. <laughs> that's Shahar. That's um that's who we had um as our armed guard um for most of our tour. And then this is hilarious. Remember what I said in the beginning about the Great Jewish Network? You know anybody? Okay, so in the airport in Tel Aviv, and I was waiting with the rest of the J and F people to be taken to the hotel. This woman here, Mira, I grew up with. <laughs> I grew up with her in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And I recognized her and her mother. Um, I did not see them my entire tour. They were in the other hotel. They were in the Kedma Hotel. But I saw them at the at their farewell dinner. So it's just, it is such a tiny, tiny um, Jewish world that I would bump into somebody that I hadn't seen in 30 years. Um, that I would bump into them Um in uh in tel aviv um it was an amazing trip um if you can go i highly recommend it um jnf is still running um volunteer tours um they are i believe sold out through may but they have um june um available um i would absolutely 100 percent um go again 100 percent would go again i i found it one of the most meaningful um, trips of my life. Um, and, uh, I met a lot of great people. Um, I'm going to, um, open it up for questions. If, um, anybody has any questions for me? Oh, yes. Barry has a question, which I am trying to find. Who oh, has? Who is she calling? Who is she calling? Barry. Yes, Barry, I will send that to you. I will send you the address where you can send um, JNF donations. Um, yes, absolutely. I have that for you. Does anyone else have a question for me? Shirley, what? Shirley and Bernie. Bernie has one. Oh, uh, what uh, date uh, were you in Israel? Uh, so I left on February 17th. I left the United States and um, I came back on the 23rd. So just, oh. just three weeks ago. Oh, so you're there really, you went there in the middle of a water. Uh, that's the whole reason I went. Yes. That's the whole reason I went. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I was, um, I was lucky enough to have a dinner with a cousin um, while I was in Tel Aviv and, and she thought I was a little crazy. <laughs> So it's not just it's not just you. Um, anyone else have um, a question for me? Amy, it's Michelle. Yes. I don't I have, have a question. I just want to thank you oh, for putting together pleasure. a phenomenal show. Jim said more people should see this, and um, thank you for your for your labor that you did, for the love that you shared, for bringing our, my notes to the wall. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> and um, really just lovely. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Thank you, Edward. Barbara, do you have a question? Just a quick one. How sure are the families of the hostages that their, you know, that their, their child or whatever is still alive? They're not. Hamas has um, given, um, Hamas refuses to give a list of who is dead and alive. Um, Israel believes 30 of the 134 hostages are dead, but there's always hope. I remember um, the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit was held for five years before he came home. So, um, right. you know, there's, there's hope. Um, 
you know, but, um, but you know, they're, they're not sure. They're not sure. That's part of the reason why, um, why the IDF is there is mainly to, to find the hostages. Can you, can you put the address where you can send a donation in the chat? Um, sure. I will look that up. And um, Carol Ann, the um, the tour by um, by JNF is heavily subsidized. It's about two thousand dollars plus airfare. Okay. And I I will tell you for Israel that is heavily subsidized. Um, it's expensive to to uh, to go to Israel. Yeah. Maybe one of my grandchildren would want to go. Maybe I can help fund it. So you have you. I don't know how old your grandchildren are. You have to be at least eighteen. Oh, thank you very much for even thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> they were in their late twenties and thirty. <laughs> I think they'll they'll pass. <laughs> thank you. Of course. I'll look, I'll look in the chat now for it. Well, I'm I'm looking it up. Usually, okay. um, people donate online, so I'm looking. Um, if oh, I well, can't find it, I will email um, everybody that participated later. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You yes. did a beautiful job. Thank this you. Very interesting. Very. Thank you so much. It's so nice that you incorporated both your own personal experience as well as, you know, the more uh, historic. Well, I think it was important to give a little background of, you know, yeah, why and where and yeah. when. The maps are very helpful, I think, too. I... It's one of the smarter things I did. Was... <laughs> <laughs> Take a snapshot of where I was. Um, also, I didn't. I didn't want to forget. Um, How far were some of those kibbutzes from, say, Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? You know, um, it's about an hour and a half drive. I remember. Remember, um, Israel is very, very small. Um, yeah, you can travel all of Israel um, in just a few hours. It's about an hour and a half drive um, south from Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question for me? Nope, that's it. Well, if you think of one later, um, I will be um, you know, checking my email. I'm happy to answer any questions. Or if you see me at Shabbat, um, I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Um, and I really, I wanna thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm delighted to see so many people <laughs> online. And um, this will be posted later on um, BJC's, um, on you uh, your YouTube page. So it will be up on, on our YouTube channel. Um, and if you follow me um, on Facebook, you will see um, photos that didn't make it in the slideshow. Um, I had I had four hundred photos. Oh my gosh! Some of them, some of them made the slideshow, and some of them did not. Um, so you know, so I'm I'm happy to show you more photos. <laughs> many many more photos. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Amy. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank it was you. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye. A person out.